All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, we still have some people coming in, but uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to another edition of Live with the League. I am Matt Bach, Assistant Director of Strategic Communications for the MML. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to kick things right off with a, a couple of guests. And then we're going to go into our Lansing team uh, to cover a, a range of issues, everything from the state budget to uh, the short-term rental issue. If you have any questions on those issues or any other issues, feel free to post <clears throat> them in the chat. Or if you're watching them on face, watching this on Facebook Live, you can post it in the comments, and I'll let uh, we'll try to answer your questions the best we can. So today we're joined by uh, Danielle. Uh, I can I'm, I'm blanking on your last name, Baird, right? It's, Baird, yep. I got it right. And Emily Kalashevsky, that one I can say, but I can't say Danielle. Why is that? I don't know. Anyways, it's, it's Monday, so that's that's my excuse. So uh, welcome, both of you. Uh, Danielle, we're going to start with you. Um, you got a kind of a couple of major announcements to make regarding uh, the foundation. Of course, you work for the Michigan Municipal League Foundation, which is our uh, uh, part of the league. Um, and talk a little bit about the Bridge Builders Program and uh, the latest on, on that issue and, and why you're on here today. Yeah, thanks, Matt. The Michigan Municipal League Foundation launched the Bridge Builders Microgrant Program last year, really in response to the pandemic. Um, we were seeing some really great projects all over the country, but also all over the state, where people were stepping up to make sure that their neighbors were still uh, connecting with one another and still building community, even though we had to remain socially distanced. So really supporting those social ties and that social economy. And this year, we've had the chance to expand the program into two categories. And the first one is the neighborhood micro grant. So that one, we're actually in the semifinal round right now, where we have um, we have uh, 20 semifinalists that are actually in a public voting round right now. And that voting closes on Wednesday, June 30th. So people have an opportunity to vote for their favorite project. And those votes will be considered by an external review panel um, as long as, as well as uh, some other categories that they'll be scoring the projects on. So that's an opportunity for people to really engage with this process and tell our judges what they would, uh, what they'd like to see funded in Michigan. And then the second category that we have is actually the Main Street category. And that one is funded in partnership with the DT Energy Foundation, where we'll be giving away four $5,000 micro grants to communities across Michigan. And that grant program really encourages uh, small business owners to work in collaboration with artists from around the state to, uh, to really engage in public space activation projects in a way that bring people back to our downtowns, celebrate local arts and culture, as well as uh, really drive that local economy again as we reemerge from the pandemic here. So those are the two and categories. Yeah. yeah. Oops. And, and you said that, um, that you know the, the programs are supported by the foundation, but also this particular one, the, the Main Street one, is supported by the DTE uh, Foundation, yeah, um, mm -hmm. and that's really nice to have their support. How are generally how are these programs funded, and is there anything people can do to kind of help with that that funding? Yeah, so these programs really are funded through um, donations from our donors. So a lot of individual donations have come in, and we are actually running a matching gift campaign that's open for a couple more days through June thirtieth where your donation will be doubled. Um, and I believe that they're putting a link in the chat to that campaign there. So your donation will be doubled up to $5,000 uh, for the next couple of days through June 30th. So if people would like to make a gift to this program, it will actually allow us to get out more grants this year uh, in our neighborhood category. So hoping to fund more projects around Michigan, and it's a way to make a really quick direct impact uh, as well as you know double your impact right away. Right. Yeah, it's a really a good program. What What are some of the projects that have been funded in the past, particularly, I'm guessing at the $500 level, because this is the first year for the $5,000 one, but mm -hmm. what are some of the projects we're seeing and, and what kind of inspirational things are out there? Yeah, last year, there were really a lot of great programs. We funded seven projects last year. This year, we intend to fund at least 10. There will probably be more thanks to the matching gift campaign and those who have donated already. But last year, we funded projects that kind of really ranged. There was one where they did a community-wide book read that was meant to be an intergenerational book read between students and adults in the community um, on the book, Just Mercy. And then there was another program out of Ypsilanti that was just fabulous where they were actually using a community garden to teach about the history of the Underground Railroad in Michigan through agriculture. 
And so the garden itself was growing foods that would have sustained people who were escaping slavery from the South and coming into the North and specifically coming through even Ypsilanti, Michigan. So it was a really great way to tie um, food security and agriculture and history and local history. And then another project that we had funded was, um, it was actually a community Halloween event where it was a really great event where actually the applicant for that, one of the people on the application team, she went on to win the uh, Volunteer of the Year Award and has gone on to do a lot of really great stuff. But they hosted a Halloween event for kids because generally kids in their community were going outside of the community for trick-or-treating. And while that's something where, you know, trick-or-treating or Halloween seems a little bit superficial, it actually really says a lot about a community when kids are going out and knocking on strangers' doors and asking for candy and feeling safe and welcome to do so. Uh, so it's actually a really powerful thing that all of these applicants are doing and all of the uh, grantees last year as well as people who are applying this year are doing. Really been encouraging and positive. Right, and, and, and so right now, uh, the both programs have voting components. One I think is wrapping up, you said, and then one starting up. Talk a little bit more about the, the voting part of it and how that works and what happens if you get voted for. Yeah, so people are allowed to vote once per day on this, um, and I believe there's going to be a link in the Facebook chat that will allow people to vote for the neighborhood microgrants. Like I said, the, that category, the voting round is wrapping up on Wednesday this week, and then the Main Street category voting will launch later this week. And so the votes are really a way to help us gauge community interest and community support for a project. Um, they're not going to be the sole determinant of the winners of the grant, but they're going to be a way for judges to help them understand, you know, does the community want to see this happen? Is there broader support? And the votes, of course, are going to be weighted by size of the community because we have some very large communities applying and some very small communities applying as well. All right. Well, great. Well, thank you, Danielle. Anything else you wanted to add about the, the two programs? Um, I think that's all I've got, but if anybody has questions, um, they can reach out to the foundation um, and, you know, visit our website and visit our donate page that's posted in the chat. So, yeah, thanks so yeah, much for letting me talk about this today. Oh, for sure. And this is a program we hope to continue, you know, mm -hmm. uh, beyond this year. So if you have an idea of a project or you know a volunteer that's, you know, doing some amazing work in your community, encourage them to, you know, apply for this program. Uh, well, we can put Danielle's email in the, in the chat here. So if you have any questions about that, uh, feel free to reach out to her. So thank you, Danielle, for joining us. Thanks so much. All right. And now, speaking of voting, we're going to switch over from one voting uh, campaign to another voting campaign that also recently wrapped up. And Emily, you're going to talk to us a little bit about the Community Excellence Award program. Uh, start off just explaining what this program is and, and where we're at in the process right now. Sure, so our Community Excellence Award program was started in 2007 as the league's most prestigious community honor. Um, and since then, we've asked communities to submit projects that involve a number of different um, topics, really innovative transformational things they're doing in their communities. So we kicked off our CEA program, our 2021 program, back in Capital Conference when we started asking communities to submit their projects to us. Um, and from there, all of those projects went live on our website back in May for community members to go on and vote for their favorite project. Uh, and simultaneously, we had a group of three judges who were also reviewing um, the submissions that we had on our website. Uh, this year, we had a record-breaking 25 project entries, uh, all wow. really incredible, impressive, um, thoughtful projects that communities have been doing. Uh, some of them are traditional projects that we've seen um, sort of year after year, and others are projects that really focus on COVID-19 recovery and response. Um, so lots of really remarkable things that our communities are doing. We had a number of uh, votes coming in online for uh, folks' favorite projects. The judges were in charge of scoring these projects. They selected three. Uh, the online votes uh, selected our single fan favorite finalist. Um, and we were able to announce that last week. So we've got our four finalists together. I'll, I'll tell you who those are in a moment. Um, but these four finalists will now move on to our convention where they will do a presentation on their project. 
Um, and they'll likely also have a booth um, where our attendees can come by and learn a little bit more. Um, and all of our convention attendees will be able to vote for their favorite project and the winner will then be awarded the final Community Excellence Award. So um, it's quite a long process since it starts at our Capital Conference, ends at our convention, uh, but it gives a chance for a lot of communities to shine in the process, which is what I really appreciate about the program. So getting into the results a little bit, uh, if, if folks haven't seen the video that we posted, if, I believe last Wednesday, uh, our 2021 CEA fan favorite finalist was Sterling Heights. Uh, their project's titled Recreating Recreation in Sterling Heights. The other three finalists include Delta Charter Township for their project, uh, Delta Charter and Lansing Charter Township's Waverly Pathway. Uh, we also have Rochester Hills for their project, Reimaging, Reinventing, and Renewing Auburn Road. And finally, uh, East Lansing, the Daytime, Nighttime, Anytime Place Project. So this year we've got Sterling Heights, Delta Charter Township, Rochester Hills, and East Lansing as our four finalists we will see at convention in just a few short months uh, when we're there in Grand Rapids. And the uh, convention in Grand Rapids is in person this year. It's at the, toward the end of September. You can find that at our website, mml.org. And uh, it's a really exciting thing. What we do is, is we have the, the communities, the four finalists present at the beginning of the conference. And then over the days of the conference, people get to vote. And then we announce it at the very last session. It's a great high energy thing to have at the end. And we usually have like little streamers and things that, that blast off that are pretty exciting. And of course they get the cup, the coveted cup, which is like a, our kind of our version of the Stanley cup that they can have for the year and, and use as bragging rights. So it's a really exciting, uh, fun program. We have some great finalists and all really all the projects. The fact that we had 25 projects during a pandemic was pretty amazing and, and really a credit to our communities. Yeah, and I'll just mention that, you know, only four finalists are selected to move forward, but I think um, having worked on the back end of this, um, the votes were really close um, and we had quite a few come in. Um, and also the scores were really close from the judges. So um, we'll be working on ways that we can highlight some of the other projects that may not have made it to the final round uh, in the coming months. So it's likely that you'll see them featured in our magazine on our social media pages so that you can learn a little bit more about them because it's not just the four final projects that are really worthy of the spotlight. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about the CEA process or um, read about our finalists from this year or even years past, you can go ahead and visit our website at cea.mml.org to do so. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, really, it, it's hard, always hard to pick winners, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you don't want, you know, it's hard to get it down to four. And I really want to thank our judges. Uh, talk a little bit real quickly about who the judges were and, and uh, how, you know, what they kind of said, if you, if you heard the thing about their feelings on the, the projects. Well, I, what I liked about our judging panel this year is that I think they, they brought um, a range of perspectives to the program. Uh, we had Alfredo Hernandez, the racial equity officer for the Michigan Department of Civil Rights. We also had Amy Hovey, the special projects coordinator at Mott Foundation, join us as a judge this year. And uh, we have Chad Livengood, the senior editor for Cranes Detroit Business, join us. And uh, many Actually, all of the judges uh, told me that this was a really difficult process. We try to make it as easy as possible for our judges to participate, um, but because all of the projects were um, so different and interesting and um, transformative in their own ways, uh, I think it made the scoring process pretty difficult. Uh, many of them, um, you know, mentioned that there were some of the COVID-19 projects that they were impressed with. I know intergovernmental cooperation was also big. Um, and you'll notice out of the finalists even, um, I, I believe East Lansing, their project is sort of related to the COVID-19 pandemic and, and some response to that um, in ways that the other projects maybe are more of the traditional projects that we've seen. So um, this was the first year that we added in um, that category. Of course, we, we said if there are projects out there that deal directly with COVID-19 response or recovery efforts, we wanna see those as well. Um, and we weren't quite sure what we'd get in. And so we've, we've seen a lot of those projects come in and, and the judges commented on that as well, that it was great to see such innovation um, and such a time of, um, you know, challenge for local governments across Michigan. 
Yeah, for sure. Well, good. Uh, well, thank you, Emily. And uh, if you have, uh, if any of our people watching today have questions for Emily, we'll, we'll also post her email in the chat. You can reach out if you have questions about this program for next year. Um, if you are interested in having your community submit, we would love to have you. Uh, so thank you, Emily. Thank you, Danielle. I uh, appreciate you guys joining us today. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. All right. Yep. And thank you. So now we'll shift over to our Lansing team. Uh, and we want to talk about the latest legislative issues that they're facing with, and we'll kick things off with the league's uh, Jennifer Richterink, who is one of our legislative associates. Uh, Jen has been working tirelessly uh, for several, several weeks now on the short-term rental issue. And uh, there is some developments this week uh, that we were hoping to are hoping to get our members assistance on. So I'll have Jen kind of launch into that. Talk about the short term rental, the bills that we're looking at and what's the ask of our members this week. Sure, Matt. Thanks. Um, well, I want to start off by thanking everyone who has um, continuously been engaging on the short term rental issue for us. Um, this week, we're anticipating um, House Bill 4722 um, is scheduled to be on um, third reading in the House um, on Wednesday. Uh, tomorrow, they have session, but there's no attendance, no um, votes being taken. Um, and so Wednesday, uh, it's anticipated that that bill is going to run again. Um, just like it has been the last few weeks, we've been able to um, keep the opposition up and get it pulled from the agenda. So we're hoping to um, continue that and have that done this week as well. Um, just a couple of things for folks. Um, we did a, a new blog uh, late last week um, on the, the sub. Um, if you're talking to your legislator, I think there's some important factors to know um, that one, um, if your legislator says there's a compromise, um, it is not a compromise that local government has been a part of. Um, at this up to this point, and that um, if you're told they have the votes to pass it, um, we would push back against that statement um, and, and say that we don't believe that um, that is factual. Um, you know, we've heard from a couple of legislators, well, they have the vote, so, um, you know, why shouldn't I just vote for it? So, um, we don't believe they do have the votes, um, in, in part to all of your uh, folks reaching out in opposition. Um, and if you have questions on where your legislator is, please feel free to reach out to me um, and let's chat one on one before you reach out. And if your legislator is a solid no, even if they started out as a yes or possibly a co-sponsor of the bill, um, and they are a solid no now, uh, one, you want to make sure we keep them a solid no, but two, thank them for seeing the error in their way. Um, I will tell you that um, uh, we need to remember to be respectful and professional in, in when we're addressing um, these legislators because um, going the other way does more harm than help to us. Um, and we want to make sure that they keep communicating with us on this issue. Um, so as much pressure as you're putting on for opposition, uh, when folks are um, uh, opposed and standing strong, we need to make sure we are thanking them um, and, and seeing how we can get them to, to engage and get their uh, colleagues to be solid no's as well. Yeah, I think it's, it, it's important to know that, you know, it is it's very frustrating as this bill very clearly was, you know, anti-local control and took away a lot of the ability of local governments to regulate these short-term rentals. So there was a high frustration level. But it's important not to let that frustration roll over into, you know, emotions where you're attacking or or come across as, as being attacking that, you know, try to have a constructive criticism with them and maybe try to understand why they're voting uh, the way they are. And then if they're still supporting this, then, you know, walk through the talking points and the things that we have shared with our members. Uh, we do have a couple active campaigns on our voter voice, which is our action center where members can go and send letters to their legislators. Now, time is of the essence, particularly in the House, because we expect them to vote this week. So we always prefer that you call. But for those that are maybe don't have the time to call or whatever, we do have on our voter voice at MML.org and our Action Center, and also on our short-term rental resources page, which is shorttermrental.mml.org. Uh, we have an Act Now button, and you can click on that, and you'll see two options there. One is to send a letter to your law uh, legislator, which we're continually updating with the latest information, so it's not the one from two weeks ago. It's a brand new letter. 
So even if you sent a letter, say a week or two ago, it's a new letter now. So we would encourage you to send it again um, using the same tool. And then we also have a function where you can send a letter to your editor through our Action Center to the local newspaper. So a lot of you uh, have smaller papers that still run letters to the editor. And so you can use that tool to, to send that letter to them. So any kind of support we can get from our members would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, and if you haven't already do, done so, I would encourage you to be engaging with your local realtors. Um, I am finding from um, some of you who have reached out that you have local realtors who are not on the same page with their statewide association. And we need those realtors to speak out and contact their uh, legislators, the leadership in the House, um, as well as, I mean, that letter to the editor would be a great function for if you have local realtors who are opposed to the short-term rental legislation. Um, it, feel free to contact me um, if you'd like help with that on, on what kind of information to send them. Um, but we definitely need local realtors who are not on the same page with the statewide association um, to, to get involved and to speak out. Yeah, that's a, that's a great example. I happen to have a friend that owns a couple of resorts in the Oscoda area, and she's also a, a licensed real estate agent. And she was of this, that feeling where she's like, you know, I don't support these bills. She's also serves on the local BDA and some other things. So she kind of has a lot of different hats. And she goes, I see the value of having local control and having decisions that are best made with our residents in mind made at the local level. So she was uh, definitely opposed to these bills and reached out. Um, so that is very helpful. I, I appreciate uh, all your work on this, Jen, and this really important issue. You know, the league has put all of our resources and all of our efforts into this issue. Uh, this is, you know, we, we try to pick our pick our fights. You know, we not every single bill that comes across, we're, we're we have a position on, but this one is one of those ones that we're ready to do everything we possibly can uh, to to fight because we it's really it's a root local control issue. So it's important that our members reach out and talk to their lawmakers um, about why these these bills are are bad for our cities and bad for our state. Yes, and and know that the league has been um, offering compromise ideas. Um, the issue so far has been that those ideas have been, um, I guess, tweaked through the realtor lens, uh, the realtors, the Michigan realtors, um, and just added to the bottom um, of a bill uh, that's already bad. And they're not changing any of the existing language. I mean, section one of uh, that bill, 4722, needs to be modified or just struck out um, because it's saying that every um, rental of less than 30 consecutive days is a by right permitted residential use in all residential zones. Uh, can't be held to a special use, conditional use, or any procedure different than other dwellings in, the, in those zones, and that it is absolutely not a commercial use. And so um, anything that they add at the bottom doesn't negate that very first section, and that's a huge issue. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's really important to note when you call or when you write a letter that, you know, we are not opposed to short term rentals. All we all we do is want the local community the ability to regulate them. We don't want any communities to ban them because that was one of the early messaging that the realtors were saying. It's like, oh, the league just wants to ban short term rentals. And we do not. We recognize the economic value, the, the value to our tourism economy of these of these short term rentals. We want them in our communities. We just want to be able to regulate them so that our neighborhoods, you know, don't turn into just a short term rental community. We still want a mix. Yes, definitely. Sorry, I got my dogs going on there. <laughs> All right. So Yeah, if anyone has any questions or would like to know where their legislator is on this issue before they reach out and contact them, please feel free to um, get in touch with me and, and we can go from there. Great, thank you, Jen. So we will bring on. Uh, I was just going to bring on Chris. And, go ahead, Chris. I was just going to add something here, and, and Jen's done a great job with this. The, the, one of the key things that uh, that we've been talking with our members about as well is just how important this is for every community in Michigan. This is not just this is not just a vacation community, a seasonal community issue. The way this bill is worded, it impacts every community across the state if you have a rental program. And I think that's that's very important for members to realize that this is not just not just for our shoreline communities. Yeah, definitely. There is um, in the language in 4722 where it talks about rental inspections. Um, it says that your 
um, that you can do that, but it can't have the effect of um, prohibiting a short-term rental. Well, if you inspect someone and they fail the inspection, you have now prohibited them from being a short-term rental. I mean, that language right there um, affects any uh, rental because they can always just tweak um, an existing lease to be less than 30 consecutive days. And we all know that the people who would actually take that up and tweak that are those properties and, and landlords that you're probably already having issues with in your community. Um, so this is definitely, as Chris said, um, is not just a shoreline um, you know, destination place issue. Uh, and I mean, big picture, this is gonna enter into an exemption into the, the Short-Term Rental Act that now other specific uses can come in and ask for too and point to that um, as being the reason um, they should get it. And, and, and that also, I was gonna say that, oh, that right, as, as Jen and I have been reviewing the language with, with others, it's uh, very carefully crafted by the proponents to, to create a large loophole. I mean, it, it, it talks about dwellings of any type. Uh, it, you know, there's questions of what does that do for mobile home parks? What does that do for apartment buildings? There's a lot of questions about how this language has been crafted. This is not a, it, in fact, nowhere in this bill does it say short-term rental. Uh, it, it specifically talks about uh, preempting the Zoning Act uh, for rentals of less than 30 days. Yeah, uh, for sure. And, and Jen, you mentioned something earlier that, you know, the, the, the legislators are calling this a compromise. And, and we have put together several compromises, but those are not reflected in there. You posted a blog, I think, last week where we talked, outlined our, our proposals and, and listed specific things. Also, Senator Horn has a bill out that has some co compromises that we would be open to. Uh, send a representative the moose had a bill out that we'd be open to so there are compromises out there because there's some sentiments like well the league's just going to be against whatever we propose and that's not true at all we've been we've been wanting to be at the table we've been at the table in years past where we were listened to but those bills didn't get through and now here we are and we're kind of be looking at being painted as, as the enemy of this short-term rental issue and we're not we just want to be able to have regulate them and have common sense uh, reasonable uh, regulations at the local level yeah, um, I don't know, um, and this would be a good question to ask. I mean, why do we have to use House Bill 4722? Um, this is a, uh, this legislation has a lot of issues. So when we're talking compromise, um, instead of completely striking out an existing bill that's terrible, why don't we start with a clean bill? Um, and we, it, we do need actually two bills. We need a short-term rental act um, that requires a registry um, you know, there's ideas of that being the platforms registering um, because the property owners are already giving all the information to the platforms. So the platforms register with the state. They provide some basic information um, that then is provided uh, to the state that provides that to the local to help with enforcement. So you know who the property owners are, where the properties are at, and how many nights they're being rented. Um, so we really need two bills. You need the zoning piece that says and clarifies that you cannot ban um, or have overly restrictive uh, regulations that have the effect of banning. And then we need the Short-Term Rental Act. Um, that would, again, be the enforcement piece and, and, and help our locals be able to see how many nights a place is being rented. Right, and Jen, we did get a question uh, came through from uh, Michael Kane, and he said, would this legislation prevent homeowners, associations, condos, mobile home parks from creating their own regulations? Is, are those related at all? No, and, and that's the thing. When we talk about private property rights and we talk about locals not being able to do this, um, the folks who are supporting this legislation seem to be fine with homeowners associations and condos, condo associations being able to ban short-term rentals. Um, this legislation doesn't touch um, the rules around, um, around those different types of associations. Um, as long as you're paying a small fee, uh, you put together some, some bylaws and rules, um, it appears that you could make your own homeowners association as long as you follow the law. And I don't think we want to have a, a hodgepodge of these, you know, mini homeowners associations across our state um, just to correct something that the state legislature has gotten wrong if this were enacted into law. 
Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's a good point. It could be a real mess situation if that has to happen. All right, Jen. Uh, thank you. Uh, talk about that. Uh, did want to, uh, if you have any questions for Jen, she'll be on here. So feel free to post them in the chat. We'll get back to them on short-term rentals or or she's also uh, dealing with the, the gravel mining issue, which is kind of on hold right now. But if you have any questions on, on other issues that we're dealing with, feel free to post them in the Q&A section or in the chat. Uh, we prefer the Q&A section, but the chat works as well. So Chris and, and John, Alamakia, Chris Hackbarth, our Director of State of Federal Affairs, and John, our Assistant Director of State and Federal Affairs, uh, you're coming on just to talk a little bit about the state budget and what's the latest on that. I know uh, in the past, a uh, budget's been real near completion, but it seems like we have a little longer process this year. Well, well I, I mean, I think it's really up in the air. Uh, where's my magic eight ball here? <laughs> uh, what does it say today? The magic um, eight ball. You know, I think the legislature had set has a July 1 deadline in statute. No penalties if they don't meet it, but uh, you know, uh, last year uh, was odd from the, that timeline perspective because of COVID's impact and the unknowns around how COVID was gonna impact the state budget and, and federal funding. So they suspended that law. Uh, they've talked about doing that again this year. The Senate has passed a bill to suspend the July 1 budget deadline law. Uh, but the House has not taken it up. The House in turn, uh, late Thursday last week, passed a 170-page bill, John, is that? Um, current year omnibus bill uh, for, and then a supplemental section, essentially a baseline budget. They're basically taking current year funding with a few limited exceptions that we can talk about in a minute, um, but essentially just saying, we're gonna fund everything as it is right now and we're going to handle all of the, the additional funding requests, supplemental funding requests, all of the federal funding uh, as a separate bill in and of itself. Uh, looking at those dollars as one-time dollars, let's set an ongoing budget right now, and then let's talk about uh, kind of the one-time spending uh, over the summer. So we have one day this week. Uh, the Senate is going to come in. The House is going to come in. We'll see if the Senate agrees to what the governor and, and House put together in House Bill 4410, and uh, you know that'll determine kind of what our path looks like this summer. Are we coming back multiple single days through July and August, or uh, do we come back, um, or do they finish the budget this week on Wednesday, and do we come back over the summer once uh, the leaders in the two chambers and the governor's office have come to an agreement? What are the parts of the budget that we're really keeping an eye on that has the biggest impact on our communities right now? So in the, obviously in the ongoing budget revenue sharing is top line. Uh, revenue sharing, so we track uh, revenue sharing, track the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. Uh, we track DNR's budget, MDOT's budget is huge, uh, LARA. So there are a number of, of components in each of those. When we're talking about this kind of baseline uh, budget, uh, you know, in terms of revenue sharing, the one change from current year that is included in 4410 is uh, an agreement to the governor's 2% recommended increase for, uh, for statutory revenue sharing, about $5.2 million. 1% of that would be done as uh, is include in the base, and then the other percent would be one time, air quotes, one time funding uh, that we would obviously next year ask to be included in the base. But uh, for now, that's the one main increase with regard to revenue sharing. Uh, John, you want to talk a little bit about what's changed in MDOT's budget? Yeah, MDOT's budget, again, is, is relatively simple. Uh, and I hate to say it like, like that because it's a complicated budget in the sense that there's a, a complicated formula that, that dictates all the spending. Um, but again, as, as I've stated previously, I think what we're going to see is roughly flat spending. I think what I will say, and, and as I try to remain optimistic about things that are going on around the state budget, is that as Chris had mentioned, with basically resetting the baseline of where we sat in the previous time, it gives us a lot of room to have conversations about excess GF and excess, uh, or I shouldn't say excess, but dollars in American Rescue Plan spending. And this is where I think we're going to see the biggest impact on infrastructure, both on the road and bridge side, as well as water and sewer side. You know, when we look at some of the things that the Senate's beginning to talk about right now, specifically on the bridge side, 
you know, the governor has proposed $300 million for bridge funding. Uh, the Senate is talking about $1.5 billion uh, in bridge funding, which is significant all at the local level to essentially get all of the bridges that we have in, in poor and critical condition back into good and fair condition, which, which would be a significant step forward uh, for local bridge infrastructure. The other aspect is, is water infrastructure. So just uh, last week, the Senate has introduced a supplemental uh, at $2.5 billion to deal with water infrastructure. Uh, that's everything uh, from including the governor's MI Clean Water Plan, uh, which was a $500 million program to dealing with lead pipes, to dealing with septic systems. Uh, it, it's really all inclusive. I, I think the one thing that, Chris, we noticed was maybe missing from there was some high water impact dollars, uh, which we've reached out and talked about. We know those conversations are still ongoing, but maybe in different forms. But when we think about investment in infrastructure in the state, uh, and where we may end up uh, come the end of the fiscal year for the state uh, towards October 1, we can see significant resources invested into that space. And this doesn't even begin to discuss the fact that, at least in principle, uh, the White House and some congressional leaders have, have, have talked about and agreed to a framework for infrastructure. So uh, there's a lot to, to happen in this space in the next three, four, five months. Uh, I don't know that I'll be as busy as Jen with short-term rentals, but I'm sure it's bound to pick up. Uh, and, and I think right now I'm, I remain very optimistic about our ability uh, to see significant investment uh, in the local infrastructure. Well, what, what okay. John's saying is 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 really important because we have a, a governor who's announced uh, a bridge replace, local bridge replacement plan, and you have a house that included it in one of their versions, and you have a Senate that proposed a billion and a half. So somewhere between a billion and a half and $300 million, we will likely see an agreement on local bridge replacement. I mean, there's all three sides of, of the triangle are in agreement on that. Similar on water infrastructure, you've got a, a federal American Rescue Plan Act that, that specifically identifies water, sewer, and broadband as uh, infrastructure investments that are authorized. You've got a governor that's proposed a $300 million, $290 million, uh, plus some other bonding uh, changes for water infrastructure. You've got a, a, a Senate that's put a two and a half billion dollar proposal out there. Again, you've got both sides talking about the same uh, the same spending priorities. There is an expectation that somewhere in the middle between those amounts, we're going to see major investments in those areas. And again, that's not to mention any of the other literally billions of dollars that they have to spend this summer. So, uh, like I said, you. You may see a very kind of uh, bland budget come out here this week, but know that there's the a lot of the the spice, a lot of the ingredients uh, are still being are still being mixed together, and that's going to happen uh, over the course of the summer. Right, and uh, yeah, so it's more on the horizons, I guess, as they say. John, uh, one question, kind of for you: Would this include any funding for bridges within our neighborhoods or on private roads, or are we only talking about main roadways and highways? Yeah, so uh, with this, the way in which this program would operate, regardless of how many dollars end up being in it at the end of the day, is through a, a model that the Department of Transportation is currently running right now, um, known as bridge bundling. And, and that program, essentially what it does is it, it packages together multiple bridge projects as a way to develop efficiencies, both in, in scale and in cost. But those bridges that in, get included on that are only those bridges that are at either on the county road system or on the city and village system. Now, there may be cases where bridges are within neighborhoods that could very well be on the local road system. But if there is a bridge in a neighborhood that is truly a private road that gets no funding from the state, those would not be included in this program. Well, it's important too to remember, Matt, that when we're talking some of the the road or bridge related expenses uh, proposals, those for the most part are not going to be American Rescue Plan related dollars. There's the potential that you know if if the state saw reductions in Act 51 funding that they could replace some of those. So, so there there may be some shell game that'll take place, but most of the discussion around bridge replacement funding or even any additional road investments, those will be done with one time. Uh, fund balance, general fund, fund balance. Uh, when we're talking water and sewer infrastructure and, and broadband, 
those things can be done with, uh, with American Rescue Plan dollars. And then again, as John mentioned, there's the potential for an American Jobs Plan. And if that happens, there's $109 billion, John, I think in the- Yeah, there, there's, at the start, there's like $109 billion that's associated with that. I, I think the other thing that I will add, and, and I see another question coming in here about, you know, if you're, if you're replacing bridges, what about replacing the road around it? Because there's a lot of, you know, connectivity between those two things. And I, and I agree 100%. I think what, what part of the intention and what we've seen, at least in the pilot aspect of the, the bridge bundling program, is the idea is that especially in smaller communities you offload a significant cost that is typically paid for either by act 51 funding or even in some cases a millage or your own general fund dollars and the idea is, is that by putting this money into one of the most expensive pieces of infrastructure in which we have to maintain at the local level that other revenue sources are now freed up as a result of that which one will allow you to to put more dollars into the pure you know surface of the road or, or reconstruction, you know, those types of things. You know, I think the other issue is, is one, what Chris said is, is one, what comes down and, and how does that, that happen at the federal level? And we cannot forget that the state does have some available general fund dollars as well that could play into, you know, the overall road funding discussion. I, I know in the most recent, um, you know, supplemental that was passed for the, the current fiscal year, there was a shift of dollars that's going to send uh, some federal money to the department. And as a result of that, more money is coming into to local units of government, which is going to boost their, their annual revenue. So right now, I, I don't want to say that we're seeing, you know, more resources than we have ever had in the past. But what I will say is that we are seeing resources in a way that's going to help you shift your current allocation, maybe in a different direction. So while one pot of funding may take care of something that isn't yours directly or locals directly, it should free up other funds that will allow us to, to build upon the other infrastructure investments that are taking place. You know, and, and I guess maybe the final thing I would say is when we think about ARP funds uh, around water and sewer infrastructure, those uh, projects, one of the allowable expenses in this case, because you may have to tear up the road, is to replace the road while you're tearing it up. Now, it's got to be within the scope of the project, but that's clearly an allowable expense as, as it relates to, to the infrastructure. I think one of the things, in addition to what we've been talking about here, Matt, is we look at the budget, we talked about the fact that this budget being discussed this week is a baseline, it's kind of just a flat budget amount, uh, and that you know many of the other priorities, spending priorities, be discussed this summer. Some of those priorities that we are are very actively engaged on, uh, in addition to the bridge funding uh, and you know additional road support and water and sewer support as identified in, in the My Clean Water Plan, uh, we're obviously very active uh, in working on relief for our city income tax communities as the governor proposed. I know that is still a priority for us, regardless of the existence of, of American Rescue Plan dollars, uh, especially for those communities that might be. Uh, non-entitlement communities that are part of our city income tax uh, membership. Uh, high water shoreline erosion, John mentioned it. That is another issue that we've seen all three sides have dollars in, uh, you know, the, the, the House, the Senate, and the governor all have proposed different dollars. There's nothing in the baseline budget right now, but I think that's another one of those that we would expect to see in a supplemental. We don't know what the dollar amount's going to be yet or what the, you know, what the parameters are, but that's something we're very active around. Uh, certainly, you know, uh, when we're talking about community development funding and economic development dollars, uh, there was housing and community development fund dollars the governor had proposed. That's another thing that, again, could be on the table. Numerous other programs that the governor proposed, uh, recruitment and training funds for our first responders. Those dollars are not in this baseline budget, but are, again, something the league is supportive of, and we expect to see a push for uh, in these supplementals this summer. Uh, again, there's there's a whole host of, of those type of, of programs and additional spending priorities will be actively engaged on, um, but that'll happen kind of a stage two here once we get past this, what is being discussed right now as a baseline budget. Yeah, Chris, you know what I think is important to note, um, and I'll say at least in my time working on, on these issues, I mean, you've been doing this for a few more years than I have, uh, but um, I think what's really unique in this case is there is a lot of different pots of money that we're not used to dealing with. Where a typical state budget's gonna have, 
you know, your, your income tax coming in, your sales tax coming in, and those typical sources of money that then go into their general fund or, you know, go into Act 51 for, for transportation funding. And we have significant one-time resources like we haven't had in the past. We have multiple pots of federal money coming down for multiple stimulus packages and potentially a significant infrastructure package. And we haven't even talked, Chris, about a potential reconciliation package at the federal level around the American Jobs Plan. I mean, you're talking maybe as much as $3 trillion more trillion coming in from the federal government over, over the next few months if everything goes as, as would be ideal, I guess, maybe for, for the administration currently. Um, not to say it will or won't happen, but it's just a, a situation unlike we've ever dealt with before uh, in terms of spending and in terms of allocation. So how they mix and match those different sources of revenue is really, I think, what we're trying to get our, our arms around right now. And based on how they elect to make those decisions could really uh, sway or, or switch in which the way uh, you know, dollars are allocated and, and what priorities. Well, that's, that's a very interesting point and, and is important to kind of uh, build upon. Because I mean, we've talked about this before, the American Rescue Plan alone was $1.9 trillion. The state and local aid part of it is on, only $350 billion of that. There's still a trillion and a half dollars of American Rescue Plan that are going out to in direct aid to the public, to businesses, to states. We've talked to our budget office about the fact that there will be numerous uh, uh, competitive grants from other federal grants that they will be applying for this fall. So, you know, whereas the state received Six and a half billion in a direct allocation from from ARP, there could be you know millions and hundreds of millions more coming into Michigan as we move through the rest of the year, and those other federal departments issue those grants for other programs. And that's yeah, what's and I passed. should mention, right? And I should mention, you know, we do have our Serve My City program to help our communities navigate a lot of these things, particularly as grants become available. If, if you kind of feel lost and maybe you don't have the bandwidth staffing wise to be seeking out to make sure that there's no money left on the table, we developed and informed the Serve My City program different than what the banner behind me, Save My City, we have Serve My City, and Shannon Dreheim and at the Michigan Municipal League is uh, in charge of that program, and we'll drop her email in the text if you're looking at, it has the questions about ARP in general, or if you're looking at trying to navigate the funding, we're here to help you with that program, and that's through our, our Michigan Municipal League Foundation that, that runs that program. So uh, speaking of infrastructure, I did want to bring Harisana on a little bit. Uh, she's uh, environment uh, sustainability, but she gets into infrastructure issues as well, particularly when we talk about high water levels and having infrastructure for that. Uh, so Harisana, uh, thank you for, for joining us. And I know you have a couple of things you're following, particularly as we talk about um, uh, the, the pandemic related items like ARP. Uh, there's a, some, a new uh, list of regulations that MIOSHA put out, and so you could talk a little bit about that for us. Sure, Matt. So last week, MIOSHA rescinded their May 24th emergency COVID workplace rules. Uh, so what we saw was the uh, notification that they'll be now following the federal OSHA rules that were updated on June 10th. And so outside of healthcare settings, mask wearing, social distancing, uh, and daily health assessments are no longer required in workplaces, employers still have the full ability to enforce different measures as they, as they see fit for their environments. But what you'll start to notice is that a lot of environments such as stores and general workplaces will start to go a little bit more back to normal. That's great. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad that they, they clarified that because we were kind of nervous early on, but now it, things are kind of, of all kind of lined up. So that's, that's a good thing. Uh, thank you for that, Harzana. Any other questions or anything that's come through, Betsy, we need to cover? Um, other than that, I think we're, we're wrapping up here. Yep, I think you covered everything. Okay, good. Well, thank you, John, and everybody. Thank you to our guests, Danielle and Emily, for joining us earlier. Uh, so once again, I think our next one, uh, Live with the League, I wrote it down here so I wouldn't forget, is July 12th. Um, and we also have a couple events coming up. We have our M MME Michigan Municipal Executive Summer Workshop uh, for the city managers and other administrators that are out there, which is June 20th or yeah, coming up. Oh, actually, that already happened. I'm sorry. <laughs> MME Summer Workshop. And then the, or that's July. I'm sorry. I said June. I wrote down June. Anyways, and then we have the MAM uh, Summer Workshop uh, in August. And then our convention uh, in person in Grand Rapids is September 22nd through the 24th. 
So thank you everybody for, for that. Yeah, they did post the events calendar in case I got the dates wrong, which is probably likely. So I apologize for that. Um, and our chat is the events calendar. So feel free to click, click on that to see all of our upcoming trainings and events. Any other thing, any other departing words from our staff, Jen or anybody? Okay, good. No, no I will well, say that so again, just remind everyone to make sure you subscribe to Inside to Awake, our legislative blog. I'm sure Matt or Betsy can pop the link in there. That is our our best way to communicate with everyone uh, as it happens, as we post information on legislative happenings. Again, this has the potential to be an interesting week with uh, both chambers in for just the one day before a recess. So uh, make sure you stay up to date on everything going on at the league. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Yep, and the MME summer workshop is uh, July 20th through the 23rd, not June. So that has not happened yet. So I apologize for misspeaking on that. So thank you everybody for joining us. See you again next time.